My name is Ed Juris. I'm the uh, president of the governing board of NOACA. Our next presentation is a panel discussion uh, dealing with the new realities of transportation funding. The moderator for this panel is Medina County Commissioner Steve Hambly. Steve has served as a commissioner since 1996, so that's 16 years, and he's also served three terms as NOACA's governing board president. Many of you have, may have seen him at earlier uh, summits, and he's been very active in just about everything going on around uh, Northeast Ohio. Steve has a PhD in history from the University of Akron, and he's an adjunct professor of history at the Lorraine Community College. Steve will introduce the panelists and the topics, so I'm going to turn the microphone over to Steve Hamley at this time. Thank you, Ed. You know, uh, recently I came across a blog uh, where one of the posts was entitled, 30 Reasons Why NOACA Sucks. Um, the data back in mid-April. Um, one of the uh, staff members, um, uh, Jonathan Giblin, did a really nice job actually rebutting the uh, errors of the post and tried to convince the others that were in the blog uh, that posted that, that the many reasons why NOACA didn't suck. Um, and I have even had a little joke I was preparing to use. Uh, there was an old TV show with Chris Elliott called Get a Life, but I, I won't... Uh, refer to that too much when it comes to bloggers. Let's just say that um, there were various responses by those bloggers that were not exactly enlightening. Um, but it gave me an idea for today's summit about the need to emphasize the positive benefits of our MPO. Um, and so as, as I introduce each panelist, I've asked each of them to come up with one reason why NOACA doesn't suck, or rather how NOACA benefits Ohio. And, uh, and to share that with us. And I've asked them, obviously, to keep that brief, and then we'll get into the substance. Now, you can read about the, the biographies of our panelists in the handout. A very nice job. Uh, but in their introductions, I wanted to go above and beyond. I wanted to bring out something about them that maybe wasn't included in some of the printed bios. So I went to the source of all facts, knowledge, and infinite wisdom and statistics in modern society, otherwise known as the Internet. Um, and, but, of course, we have to be careful. Um, as Benjamin Franklin once said, a lot of things you find on the Internet just aren't true. <laughs> so the information I uncovered probably is, you know, more or less, and, but I'm sure our guests will let us know if it isn't. Today with us is our first panelist is Virginia Ainsley. Uh, thank you. Virginia Ainsley is the chief executive officer of Ainsley Associates, an advocacy firm specializing in representation of public and nonprofit organization. She holds a Bachelor of Science degree in Chemistry and Political Science from Michigan State University. She was the class of 1964, I believe. Uh, I'm not going to say anything about chemistry and politics being kind of a strange formula for a career, uh, but at least the exothermic uh, reactions, i.e. Uh, explosions for those non-techies, uh, are more predictable in chemistry than they are in politics. Uh, I believe that George Romney, uh, doing my research, was governor of the uh, governor of Michigan at the time, and then based on my internet research, found out maybe the reason why she got involved in politics. Um, as you can see, we, if we believe this picture, she was an early supporter of George Romney for president in '68. So uh, uh, there may, may explain the interest in politics. But with that, I give you Virginia Ainsley, and Virginia, if you could share with us briefly what you think. How do you think NOACA benefits Ohio? NOACA is the only place where citizens, private sector, and elected officials all join together to make decisions about how we spend or invest our federal and state tax dollars on projects that will make the most difference for Ohio. Thank you. Thank you. With us today also is Joseph Calabrese. Joe Calabrese is a named chief... Uh, the main, let me... Oh, thank you. Is the uh, Chief Executive Officer and General Manager of the Greater Cleveland Regional Transit Authority, RTA, and was named that in 2000. In 2008, uh, Mr. Calabrese was named the Best Public Transit Manager in North America, and in 2009, he received the John Hill Award from the Public Relations Society of America. His hobbies are golf and sailing. You know, often I've found that people that are tempted to kind of bring their hobbies into work. Uh, so my internet investigation skills led me to a possible link between Joe's hobbies and one of the newest, apparently, RTA future secret projects. Everybody knows about Joe's advocacy for the RTA's uh, health line. Well, what about this? <laughs> you know, that's innovative thinking. Uh, that's, that, when you, we're really talking about, uh, you know, remember his mantra has been back to the basics. As a historian, I can tell you, before, before the trains, before the cars, before the buses, there were boats. 
That's what brought many of our people here. So it's just going back to the basics. I present to you uh, Captain Joe Calabrese. <laughs> and we want to give us a little bit of a, uh, your insight as to why MPOs don't suck? Great question. Okay. And, and here's my simple answer. And I'm thinking about it, this, this is an important stuff. Here, here it is. One powerful voice speaking for many, or many speaking with one powerful voice. How about that? Very good. Uh -huh. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Good job. All right. Thank you. <laughs> With us today also is Ari Moran. He is a partner with MRN Limited, a family-owned real estate development, construction, and management company based in Cleveland. MRN specializes in the development, merchandising, leasing, financing, construction, operation of complex and creative urban developments. Although uh, Ari Moran studied the violin at the Cle Cleveland Institute of Music, I believe I think it was like the age of four, if I read that correctly, and majored in music at the Shepherd School of Music at Rice University. He uh, was too busy, uh, has been too busy, recreating the face of Cleveland. Uh, Moran draws an a, analogy between the urban facelift and his musical training says that there's a creative process involved with both the violin performance and development. Ari also performs every now and then locally with a bluegrass band called Worried Men, where he plays the fiddle. Uh, personally, I'm gratified that he's here, so maybe he can answer the questions I've had since, ever since I was in Kent State Symphony back in the 70s. Friends of mine would explain the difference between a violin and a fiddle. The difference was that nobody cares if you spill beer on a fiddle. <laughs> so I present to you Ari Moran. Thank you, Ari, for being with us, and could you tell us, what you, in your perspective, why NOAC doesn't suck? For me, it was wine on a violin, but either, okay. but either one. Um, you know, I think everyone sort of said we need a place where we can come together to change strategic foci. And one of the th I was in, I was just telling Lillian, I was in Toronto over the weekend. And if 49% growth downtown, if, you know, the only two neighborhoods in Cleveland in the region that are growing uh, being the University Circle neighborhoods and the downtown neighborhoods, if that's not proof enough that walkable, transit-oriented communities are the future, go to Toronto and walk 40 miles through Toronto and see a city that's going to grow 400,000 people in the next 10 years just in the city and see that it's all walkable, it's all mixed use, it's all transit focused. And so we need a place like Noaka where we can make decisions together uh, that really change the strategic focus of the region uh, to what it really is the future of the Western Hemisphere. Thank you. Thank you. Um, with us today is also Lillian Curry. Uh, Lillian is currently the Program Director for Architecture, Urban Design, Sustainable Development at the Cleveland Foundation. Ms. Curie joined the Cleveland Foundation in 2005 as a consultant to develop a comprehensive strategy for one of the Foundation's priority initiatives, the revitalization of the great, greater University Circle area. Ms. Curie holds a Master's of Architecture and Urban Design degree from Harvard University, as well as a Bachelor's degree in Architecture from Kent State University. Apparently, her talents range from architecture, urban design, and even the performing arts. Lillian has a video on YouTube where she dances to mine hair from the cabaret soundtrack at Groundworks Dance Theater Dance Benefit in 2010. Wait, wait, I gotta find uh, don't worry, Lillian, I'm not going to show the, the, the video here, but if you uh, want, it's just actually just one easy Google jump to YouTube, uh, just to <laughs> let you know. Well, to help round out the performing arts on this fine panel, I give you the talented and graceful Lillian Curry. Lillian, uh, why doesn't well, Noaka suck? Before I answer that, I have to say that it was for a fundraiser, <laughs> and it was for a good cause, so when you go there, it was... Um, uh, and I did not give them permission to put it on the internet. <laughs> um, nonetheless, it's there. Um, I think my comments might echo some of Ari's. I think that uh, I... I believe uh, Noaka has been a place over the last uh, 10 years where um, it's allowed uh, some of the changes around walkability and multimodes and complete streets and sustainability to not only um, be integrated into our transportation planning, but it's provided um, some resources, very important resources towards a shifting agenda that uh, I think is really the future of um, cities and for me has also um, led to some of, I think, the Foundation's most important work with uh, RTA that we'll talk about later um, that I think is really the future. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And next and last is, uh, is Greg Murphy. Uh, 
Greg is the uh, uh, is the Chief of Staff of the Ohio Department of Transportation. He served his ODOT career in the Traffic Safety Office in the Central Office where he helped reshape the Highway Safety Program. He has a Bachelor's Degree in Physics from Wittenberg University, a Bachelor's Degree in Civil Engineering from the Ohio State University, and a Master of Business Administration from Capital University. Now doing a little research for Greg Murphy on the internet originally led me, at least the number one hit was Greg Murphy, race car driver. For a moment, until I saw the picture and realized it wasn't him, I had the highest hopes for seeing the speed limit on I-71 at least being raised to 70, you know? <laughs> Just think, chief of staff being a former car, race car driver, how could you go wrong, right? Well, uh, with us today, as I said, uh, Greg Murphy, perhaps later on this morning he can help us answer the question, why is the time of day with the slowest traffic called rush hour? With that, uh, if you could tell us a little bit why you think NOACA doesn't suck. Well, again, I, I think, uh Joe, with your statement, how it's a powerful voice of many communities in one voice. Um, uh, it's written into federal law uh, that MPOs are organized, and we have 17 of them in Ohio. Uh, by federal formula, ODOT provide, is required to provide about $96 million, but in fact, we provide over $200 million to the MPOs around the state. Uh, NOACA gets approximately $44 million of that, so that's not uh, a light duty. So, there you have it. Thank you. And with that, please welcome our panelists. Now, Greg's going to probably have to leave with us, uh, to leave a little bit early, so just wanted to let you know that it's not anything we've said or anything anybody else has said, uh, but he's going to have to leave just a little bit early because of a, a prior commitment. But I want to tackle today, first off, the topic, dealing with the new realities of transportation funding. First off, I want to th throw it out to, to Greg, uh, and then we'll go to the rest of the panels. We've always had less money than we need to do roadway projects in the state of Ohio and certainly northeast Ohio. So what's the different about this situation now? Well, I would say that um, there's, there's many things that are, that are challenging, and they've always been challenging. Uh, in the 90s, when Director Ray was here before, we actually uh, had projects or money waiting for projects. Uh, so we weren't completely fully funded. We're always looking for more. But as cars became more fuel, fuel efficient, people be started to drive less. There is no federal uh, bill right now. It's continued resolution for the last three years. We found ourselves in a hole of $1.6 billion. And so what's different is we are working very hard to get projects ready and going to find money. And so we're, we're changing the paradigm at ODOT to say, let's keep, keep moving on these projects and make sure that we have the project ready and find money. And when we find, mean find money, it's not just state and federal gas tax dollars. It's working with the MPOs and the locals, SIB banks, and other, other mechanisms. So, For uh, other panel members? Uh Virginia, do you want to step in what you think the new realities are, especially your relationship to, with Congress and what's going on at the federal government? Well, at the federal level, um, the fact that we have this huge deficit in national debt overhangs everything. It's very hard to get an increase in any program, regardless of how valuable it is, you know, when everything else is facing a cut of, of 7 to 15 percent. Uh, we also uh, uh, are in an era where the economy is fragile. Uh, we may be facing some economic trouble a little farther along this year when private sector and the rest of the world financial markets realize that we may in fact end up falling off the fiscal cliff come January 1st. Um, and in that same fragile economy, we are now making the transition from a wartime economy to a peacetime economy. It's not as dramatic as after World War II or the Korean War, but it still has a significant impact on the economy and it's very hard to raise taxes in that kind of climate. Last, we live in a society where um, our whole time frames are much shorter. Even private sector now thinks in terms of what they can deliver to investors in the next quarter. We live in an era of instant messaging. We live in an era where uh, members of Congress come and they only want to stay there one or two terms, get done as much as they can, and then go on with their lives. They're not there for a long-term investment. It used to be that a member in the House, he didn't really have a chance to make a difference unless he'd been there four or five terms, which is eight or ten years. That's not true anymore. So we have, have a lot of different factors now playing out in a context where decisions are held to a very short-term goal and objective framework. Joe, what are I, the I, new realities? I think Virginia talked about the, uh, economic, the economic situation, which is certainly different and very challenging, but I think politics are also different. I, I think that, you know, I have confidence in, in taxpayers. I know the last time the gas tax was raised was 1993. I was getting 20 miles per gallon of my Ford 
the Taurus, now I'm getting 50 miles per gallon in my Toyota Prius. So I'm paying about 40% less in federal gas tax than I did before. I think if you ask most people who drive on roads today and drive on bridges, they know the infrastructure issues, they say, well, you, are you willing to pay today what you paid in 1993? I think they'd say yes, but the politicians won't even pose, pose that question to the taxpayers. Yeah. Ari, you come from a different perspective, obviously being private sector developer and, and doing great, you know, East Forth and, and everything in Cleveland. What's your perspective on what the new realities are? What's that mean? Well, the new reality from a private sector perspective, you know, when you do a, when you're in the private sector, when you do a project, you're looking at what the demand is. And the demand is very different than it was even 10 or 15 years ago. The demand, I keep going back to, is for walkable, transit-oriented communities. And, um, you know, if you, if you haven't seen uh, Chris Leinberger's piece in the New York Times, I think it was two Sundays ago, uh, it looking at, uh, you know, across the country, uh, where rents are going in different parts of uh, the region. So, for example, what we're seeing is that even in places like Columbus, that the highest rents in the region are actually in downtown. They're not at Easton and they're not in the suburbs, but they're actually downtown. We're seeing that across the country right now. We're now seeing that in Cleveland, which this is why you keep reading about all these companies relocating to downtown Cleveland from. The, from the suburbs. So the demands are changing. Where we have to build is changing. And what scares me a little bit about some of the commentary that we've had uh, you know, up until just now is that how do we, and I think this is the conversation we need to have, is how do we as a community figure out how to respond to changing demands in an environment where we're thinking in such short time frames? Lillian, you come from the, the foundation's uh, perspective. What, from your viewpoint, what do you see as the new realities and the role that uh, organizations such as yourself play? Well, um, the foundation, um, as some of you may know, has um, shifted a little bit the way we, we do business and have done this uh, 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 for about six years since our new CEO came, where we, uh, of the grant making we give out every year, uh, about half of it remains in responsive grant making. Um, but the change we made six years ago is that uh, another half of it's in what we now call board directed or, or strategic initiatives where we're targeting dollars uh, and working differently with partners in the community. It's a big shift for us, but it's also a big shift in philanthropy, especially community foundations across the country. And in the area I work in, in, in um, University Circle, but also in terms of planning and design, and development, it's safe to say that we are looking for these kind of moments when there are ch there is change happening, and um, there's the potential for innovation, and for um, using some of our resources to um, potentially um, think about uh, systems change. And so I say, I look at this moment, and I say there there's the potential for some systems change that can have big impact uh, on our region, and also. Um, you know, we, we've been starting to have some really um, early discussions uh, along the water and sewer infrastructure as well, um, where there are going to be some big investments over the next 25 years, and how we can use what are still relatively small amounts of philanthropy, but where early planning dollars uh, can be leveraged to create alignment and bring the community to the table in a way that doesn't that doesn't give the public sector. Uh, it doesn't say that the public sector alone has to do everything, but if we have better alignment where we put our money uh, together, and I think University Circle has been an example of that. So um, for us, it's it's kind of a, a, an opportunity um, for different types of alignment, mm -hmm. thinking, planning, resources. Now, Lillian's, Greg, Lillian has brought up innovation, system changes. There's no doubt ODOT has been, more recently, have a number of things involving <laughs> innovation, system changes, some obviously, to, and any change is controversial. Any proposals obviously come with criticisms. I want to bring us up to date, at least from, you know, from the perspective of ODOT, where you see uh, the, the future, what you think are, obviously, maybe brief, as, uh, brief everybody as to what the most uh, you know, news of the track, as well as uh, the turnpike study. Absolutely, and, and I guess uh, kind of the bridge between the last question and this one is, um, yeah, I mean, the federal gas tax hasn't been increased since 1993. Everybody gets that. Um, Congress isn't willing to even entertain that. I was there yesterday and Wednesday. Uh, our administration is not entertaining a statewide gas tax. So we need to change, not just say, well, let's just wait for the feds to come with bags of money on a white horse. We've, we at ODOT said we have a problem. We're going to figure out a way to fix this. 
we started with what we, we con considered tangible in-pocket savings and things that we've done, and that was what the track announced uh, on Wednesday. Uh, we, we have reduced our operational costs by uh, close to $150 million over two years. We uh, have reduced our numbers by over 400, 400 employees, which is about $40 million in savings. Um, and we've taken all those savings and different ways of doing things and put, put it back into the capital program. And things like the Cleveland Interbelt was out at 2023. It came back to, I don't remember, Howard, what was it, 2016 or 2017? Uh, and we're not done there. We're going to re keep reducing those delays until we get it back into time, in the time frame. And the other things that, are, that we're doing that are kind of more in the market will help us, the private sector, is we are engaging the private sector wholeheartedly. We've created an office or Department of Innovative Delivery, which is our P3 office, public-private partnership, but includes things like the rest areas, the turnpike study, uh, and other P3s around the state. Um, if you will, I've got to get up to you on the rest areas or the, the turnpike study, whatever format you're, you're wanting me to go with. The turnpike study sure. is, is ongoing. Uh, they've, the engineering technical side of it um, is, is, I'd say, more than half the way finished. About 75% done, which means they're looking at the pavement, the bridges, um, the toll collecting facility. Uh, and then they're getting, in, getting into the financial analysis here in the coming months. The study will be done uh, at the end of this calendar year. Uh, again, you probably have heard the director, myself, or even Jim Riley talk about it. There are no preconceived notion of what's going to happen. Uh, we're looking at all the spectrums from it stays as it is, and Rick Hodges runs it as he sees fit, and the commission itself to ODOT interjecting and bonding against it, taking it over, and using that revenue for Northern Ohio, and then also a concession on taking that revenue and, and using it for this area and other projects around the state. Um, again, it's, there's no preconceived notion of what's going to happen. The other things that we're doing are rest areas. On Monday, we released five rest areas to be privatized in southern Ohio, uh, non-interstate rest areas. Um, we should know in a few months on where the market stands on that. Uh, we believe that we have 104 rest areas around the state. It uh, costs us about $50 million a year to maintain and clean them. We believe we can take that off the books and bring some revenue into the program. Uh, we hope to have an additional package of six or eight more coming out in the coming months with the rest areas. So we are looking at engaging the private sector. We're not going to just say, well, you know, we're, uh, we're kind of not going to have any projects for the next 30 years. You guys just wait. Maybe you'll see it in your lifetime, maybe not. Um, it's interesting when you go to AASHTO, which is all the state DOTs get together and talk about this. Some states are really pushing forward and trying to close their funding gaps. Other states are sitting around saying, well, we'll just wait for the feds. And it's really un it's interesting to see how the dynamic between these states uh, when we were there a couple weeks ago, previously at ASHTO meetings, the discussion was always give us more money, give us more money, give us more money. Uh, at the last ASHTO meeting, basically ASHTO said we're going to get flat funding and you would have thought there was a celebration and parade because we're going to get flat funding. So the dynamic and the, and the, and the paradigm has shifted certainly around the country. Mm -hmm. Well, that kind of jumps over to the next question with Virginia. What's up with Congress? They're going to do a continuing resolution. They're going to reauthorize. Well, clearly the we, the we all want to know. No? Yeah, yeah. The transportation conference has gone slowly. It is moving forward in small steps. Um, please be aware. I'm I'm optimistic about this in 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 one way. If they had to, we could get a bill in two weeks. I don't think we'll get a bill by June thirtieth. Uh, Speaker Boehner said yesterday that he uh, thinks we should have a six-month extension if there is no bill, and there probably won't be, have a six-month extension until the end of December. That would put transportation in the same bucket with all the things that have to be resolved in the lame duck. Some wiser uh, folks have suggested that if we do an extension, it should last through next February, but that puts us literally at the point where the Highway Trust Fund is almost bankrupt. So we have a lot of challenges ahead of us. Uh, yesterday, uh, Senate Majority Leader Reid proposed to McConnell and Boehner that we take some of the revenue raisers in the Senate Highway Bill and, and uh, mess with them a little bit, modify them a bit, 
raise a little bit more money through those and fund not only the transportation bill, but also um, see if we can't find some resolution to the uh, jump in student loan interest rates that's scheduled for July 1st. That's good and that's bad. That legislation could move forward and if it's big enough and raises enough money, it would provide enough money that would absolutely help this conference get its issues resolved. On the other hand, if the conference doesn't get its issues resolved and they don't do enough money in that revenue bill, which is relates mostly to employer contributions to pensions and the Pension Guarantee Corporation has nothing to do with transportation. But if that is too small, then I think we've really put transportation in a bind. So it was his way of, of a shot across the bow to conferees to say, look, put your act together. Um, I'm going to try and help you raise the money, but if you don't, it could get pulled out from underneath you if you don't get some conclusions soon. So there's a lot of challenges that will be resolved in the next two or three weeks. Um, be aware that all of Washington is just holding its breath, waiting for the Supreme Court decision on health care. And, and once that happens, all of the focus for the media, a lot of congressional time and attention will shift away from just about everything else to that issue alone. And we need to make sure that we clarify with our members of Congress and give them all the encouragement we can to get this resolved as soon as possible. Let's shift gears a little bit, talk about transit, Joe, I know, obviously. And we know that the, the prior proposals from the House was to uh, take transit out of the authorization bill and then put it, take out the trust fund and put it under the general fund or whatever. Um, Joe, what about transit funding? What, what's, what's your b biggest issues? Where do you see, at least in terms of the federal? And, and then what about regionally? I think I think the biggest issues on a federal basis are, are two. Number one, what's the level going to be? Mm -hmm. and, and we know if they pass, when they pass new legislation, we automatically get hit because of our population. Our population is, is not growing, it's shrinking, and it's shrinking even more than we think it's shrinking in relative terms to other regions around the country. So we will automatically get a 5 to 8 percent whack right off the top, even if it's level of funding. So that, that is somewhat concerning to us. Uh, I think transit and highways are, are the same. You're looking for a long-term bill. We, want, we need to make some commitments for infrastructure projects. They don't happen in three or six months, so we need to do that to get the work on the road, to, to employ people who are not employed now in, in the construction trades. I think that's, that's important. When you look regionally, I think it, it comes down to a, more of a state and local issue. Um, I came from the central New York RTA, which was a seven-county region. Um, it encompassed the commuting territory. Our systems in Ohio are more county-based. And we're asking people on a county-by-county -county basis to fund a regional system. And it just doesn't work. And, and one of the issues we have is, again, Ohio is one of the poorest funders of public transit in the country. Um, uh, actually, there it's 40th out of 50 states. 99.3% um, of ODOT's money goes to highways, 7 tenths of 1% goes to public transit. Again, there are 10 states worse than Ohio, but there are states like Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, basically states with no people and no urban cores. Um, Ohio's funding for public transit was the highest when uh, ODOT Director Ray was ODOT Director previously. Okay, And, and since then, it dropped about 300%. Uh, um, it's, it's tough when you have significant drops to get back up there. Uh, just as an example, when I compare public transit funding in Ohio to our neighboring states of like population, Pennsylvania, Michigan, Illinois, all about the same population, about the same mix of urban and rural, their state funding per capita is about 40, $48 per capita. Our funding is $1.58 per capita. So significant differences. Um, we get more funding locally than they do because of the sales tax funding. But again, if that funding is generated locally, I can't, I can't, it's more difficult for me to spend some of money collected in Cahoga County to help Lorraine County transit out. So you've got to, you know, if the state could play a bigger role, even if it's a redistribution role in some cases, have public transit seen as a more regional issue, and as Hunter pointed out, it is a regional issue. How do you get from here to Akron for those jobs? Um, maybe things would be easier. Yeah. Now, Ari, you've, you've done t uh, some videos and promotion for R RTA, and, and obviously that's played an important role in your redevelopments within the urban area. I, I guess I want to comment as, as how you see uh, transit, how is it intrinsically important? Yeah, I mean, when, one of the things that happened when I graduated from college, I was down in Houston, and I came back and I realized that all my friends had left. 
and I went to visit them. And I went to, you know, I, I would travel. I'd go to like New York and Chicago and San Francisco and see where they went. And I started to see similarities in these places. And it's, I'm, I'm, I'm beating the same drum again. But they were all transit oriented. Um, and so they were all taking subways around and they were all taking streetcars and this sort of thing. And so what we said as a company, uh, seeing two things happening, seeing that demand and seeing what some of this work was happening, you know, in the foundation community, the city and others uh, to focus on transit, we said we're going to focus on the red line and its companion, the Euclid Corridor, as a company. And so we, you know, we're in Ohio City, right next to the Red Line Station. Uh, if anyone's seen Crop and Bon Bon and all that sort of stuff, uh, we're working there, um, and and we're, we're doing that consciously because it's a block away from the West 25th Street stop. Obviously, downtown, we're right on the Euclid Corridor, uh, right next to the Red Line at, at Tower City. Uh, and then, obviously, in University Circle, both with the Tudor Arms Hotel and with Uptown, uh, we're, we're transiorned Red Line and Euclid Quarter. What we see is that Red Line, uh, the ability to connect the airport to the two major employment hubs, is, again, it's the future of the city. I was, I was sort of shocked a couple of years ago when I saw Phoenix uh, was actually promoting their light rail line through Phoenix. Now, if you've ever been to Phoenix, it's like shocking to think that they would ever be promoting light rail, but they are because they understand that that's, again, that that's the future. Uh, we have a much better infrastructure in place than Phoenix does, and we really need to be thinking about how to leverage that, and the good news is I think we are now doing that. Lillian well, Foundation level, you see anything? I mean, uh, um, you know, our, as Ari was, was talking, I was thinking about why we, the foundation, is um, definitely strategically targeting our resources to leverage both the investments we've already made in the health tech corridor, or in the health line. Um, we uh, are not only now focused in University Circle, but in um, really a kind of comprehensive strategy to work with partners in Midtown and along the health tech corridor. But in a way that I think um, looks at um, the cross-cutting issues that need to be thought through when we think about redeveloping places. So, for example, um, we are now looking at a supply chain initiative with the anchor institutions uh, in how they procure um, goods and services, some $3 billion from the large, large anchor institutions. And using something like the health tech corridor um, as a, really attraction for either supply chain companies or post incubator companies who know who want to be proximate to, to, to employment but who also want a new way of, of either having their business or living close to where they work so I no longer think that um, the, the people say well this is just for empty nesters or for young professionals I don't think that anymore I think that Ari's right this is the future uh, in terms of how we need to be thinking about community development, economic development, planning, our, um, uh, transportation. It's, it's, it so needs to be thought through together in a way that it frankly hadn't been in the past where everything was really siloed in terms of how we were thinking about housing and planning and, and even driving economic development resources. Um, and so for our work, um, this is where we will be focused in terms of um, supporting transportation, transit, in the core city, uh, and um, and putting our dollars to work, uh, I'm reminded of two weeks ago the deputy secretary of transportation came to Cleveland principally because of, of Joe's work and was here in University Circle um, to see some of the collaborations and partnerships that um, were with RTA uh, around the two stations in University Circle. And I was struck by what he said to us, which was. Um, the projects there were the only two in the country that got Tiger two and three in a row. Mm. Uh, and it was because of really the fresh thinking and the fresh partnerships and the leadership of RTA um, to work collaboratively um, with partners. And so uh, I think that's also the future, a, a different kind of, of work, way of working um, with philanthropy, with the public and private sector around transportation. I really do. And uh, we're proud to be a partner, and uh, it's only going to be more for us. Greg, I guess it's kind of throwing issues brought up about leveraging collaboration. Uh, from ODOT's perspective, how do you see, uh, does this, how does ODOT view itself in terms of community development, particularly? Because a lot of that has been, as Joe kind of recognized, as it said, that, you know, it's a local local government, local initiatives, but ODOT is an important partner in, in many of these. Are Certainly, they not? we're, you know, to Joe's point a little earlier, uh, yeah, when Director Ray was here before, uh, transit was funded uh, more health healthily or however you want to say it, uh, you know, and it's gone down over time. And I, a point of clarity is 
let's be clear, transit is on the GRF, and it's been on the GRF. It's not, it's not state and, and federal gas tax. Um, so the money that we can contribute to transit is simply in, in not, it's not a part, it's in the GRF. And the GRF has been shrinking. I mean, the, the governor closed an $8 billion gap last year. Now, Director Ray and I have had many discussions, and some of with OPTA, uh, the, you know, the cycle of up and down with transit funding is just not fair to the communities. We, he wants to put together a consistent funding package of some number that we come up with, the transit folks, for the future. Now, that has to be non-state and federal gas tax money. Now, it could be something that we set up from different programs or potentially if something would happen with the turnpike. But we certainly want to do something that they're not one year they got this much, the next year they have this much less, and this, you know, so forth and so on. So we want to be a partner with transit. Our, our administration is certainly focused on transit for sure. Um, and as for the community development, absolutely. I mean, in working with the MPOs and the communities all across the state, you know, we're not only just a funding source, but we're in a mechanism to deliver projects uh, and to, you know, keep our roads uh, open and, and build the ones that, you know, develop uh, future development for uh, the developers around and, and continue to, to move that forward. I mean, infrastructure is the most important thing, but as Virginia stated, we can't get Congress to move on infrastructure. Uh, when you go there, Everyone says on camera it's important. You get back in the back rooms with the staff; they don't really care. It's only 48 billion. It's not 13 trillion. So, I think we need to keep moving, pushing on, pushing on Congress as well as working with our local partners through this. Yeah. You We're, mentioned how, how vulnerable transit is to general revenue financing. Uh, that's true at the federal level also, and and even the general revenue bailouts of the Highway Trust Fund are getting harder and harder to do. What you have to remember is that 40 cents of every general revenue dollar we spend is borrowed, and that makes it much more difficult to spend any general revenue on anything, let alone something like transit. If, if transit is going to be consistently and reliably funded, it absolutely has to stay in a trust fund that has, has a dedicated revenue stream. Well, let me let me shift a little bit. We know there's been a lot of growth and development, obviously, in the outlying suburban exurban areas in the last couple of decades. But likewise, at least the last number of years, been a significant amount of investment within the urban areas, within Cleveland particularly. Ari, uh, from your perspective, I mean, as the corporation, you didn't go out into the suburbs, you didn't go out into the exurban, you, you, you focused on the urban core. Is this really just about you know, chasing the dollars, or is this really, I, I, I've got the perception from your the videos and seeing you in all sorts of different places, you have a vision about how this actually not only helps the urban area, but also helps uh, suburban areas as well for a region. Go ahead. No, I think that's true, and I think initially it started a vision, and what's really crazy to say is now I'd say over the last year we've hit a tipping point where it's also now that the dollars are there, um, and so it, it's mm -hmm. starting to change. One thing I would bring up, um, we've been talking a lot about transit, and one of the, the, the collaboration that the Joe and Lillian and others are talking about, what that produces is, I think, interesting, you know, at Uptown, uh, we've been leasing apartments. We just we just started leasing a couple months ago. Uh, we're almost 60% leased. Uh, actually, the buildings aren't even open for occupancy. We're, we're pre-leased. Um, and what's interesting about the rent rolls is about 80% are coming from outside the region, and most of those are coming from outside the country. That dovetails with the impact that this work has had on Case Western Reserve University, where they've more than doubled their freshman class. Uh, doubled their freshman class coming in this year. And again, most of those folks are outside of the region and outside of the country. Why is that important? I bring up Toronto again. Uh, when I was there, I, I was shocked at this number. 50% of the people that live in the city of Toronto were born in another country. 50%. The growth that we're talking about is fueled uh, exclusively by immigration of high-skilled workers. We have 30,000 jobs that are unfilled um, in, in, in the biotech uh, area in this region. They have to be filled by people that are immigrating uh, to, the, to the city. That's important to this discussion because the type of lifestyle that we're talking about is one that attracts this type of person and it, it's critical that we attract this person. So that's a vision for the future but it's a vision that really is, it encompasses the whole region. If we can't attract uh, if we can't attract immigrants, then we can't compete at a global scale. 
Uh, Lillian, I mean, on the foundations about about attraction, about making us look uh, good, I guess at least the, uh, demonstrating all the really great attributes that many of us know have lived in, uh, lived here for many years. Um, yeah, you know, the, uh, the, the Uptown Project, for example, from our perspective, and why, you know, we have the largest uh, program-related investment, which is a loan. We, we do some loans that we've ever done in our history to, to that development. Uh, we also have dollars invested in partnering to help with the transit station being moved to Mayfield and design, et cetera. And the reason uh, we're doing it, too, is because um, University Circle and the employers there uh, are important to the region. And if they're not thriving and attracting um, the talent and growing and also have the population that they serve, the hospitals, et cetera, it's, it's, gonna, it's not good for the region. So it's not just about the core city uh, from the perspective of our um, saying over the long haul. So it's been six years that we've targeted resources to University Circle, greater University Circle the neighborhoods. It's safe to say we're going to be in it for the long haul um, because we care about the neighborhoods that surround it. But we care about it because it's important to the region. And Uptown in particular uh, uh, is, from our perspective, is people were coming to University Circle to do one thing and going home, going to the hospital, go home, go to the museum, go home. It's kind of a single destination, ironically. And what this project and the integration of transit to the Red Line and the Health Tech Corridor and the, the development is doing is not only attracting students and making the university more competitive globally, not just in the country, it's now more competitive globally. And they will say they can attribute it to students choose to go to college differently today. And there's a, they want a different experience. Um, but also, uh, from, from the perspective of Uptown, it's because now people are able to come there and do three or four different things and experience many things and, and think about transit and walking uh, to Little Italy or to the neighborhoods in a totally different way. So uh, it's kind of a, uh, a kind of integration, if you will, in thinking. Um, on many levels where transportation is just a piece of it. So my, my sense of, from my perspective, the discussion here is we need to be much more integrated in our thinking of transportation, transit, planning, um, beyond physical development, if you will, from my perspective. It has to be way beyond physical development. Yeah. Joe? You know, three or four years ago, we looked at studies that said, you know, people want that urban environment. I mean, you know, and um, some of us believed it, some of us didn't. The truth is it came on us much faster than anyone anticipated. I mean, it's here. The, uh, the young, the 25 to 35, the young educated professionals, that it's so important for Cleveland and every city to retain and attract want that lifestyle. I know Hunter talked about the, uh, the, the event they had in downtown Cleveland, the young professionals, and Hunter and I kind of stood out because we weren't quite that young, maybe even not that quite professional. You remember being but, young? But, <laughs> but the discussions around that table were all about walkability, complete streets, uh, uh, environmental consciousness, you know, the 24-hour city, uh, the 24-hour public transit. Uh, but they're there, it's here, and, and we really have to, as a state and as a county and as a region, we have to leverage that now because that's going to be the future. You seem to be saying uh, that it's just not about the cost of gas. No. That's driving this. It's, it's, actually it's, it's consumer preference. It's an experience. How do we keep that going? Well, I don't think it's about keeping it going. I think it's about seeing that, it, it. that it's here. And we do need to feed it and fuel it. But if this is a case for our region that if we, are, if, we don't, if we don't head there and head there quickly, we'll be left behind again. Um, this is the future. Um, and uh, so this is a case where we need to get out in front of it. And we're starting to see it already. I mean, I'm, I'm as optimistic as I am about how people are beginning to work together. I, I think we're going to see something really special along the Health Tech Corridor in Midtown um, that's beyond, that's building off of the investment that's already made. But it's happening because of it. Um, so, um, so I think we need to move quickly uh, mm -hmm. in this direction. Otherwise, I think we're going to miss something. It sounds like at the micro-regional levels we can handle some of these things. I mean, really, without the leadership of of uh, Congress or even in Columbus in some ways, obviously partnership with them. But what do we do about the mega projects? What do we do about the, the inner belt? Or the, was it the Brent Spence Bridge between Ohio and Kentucky? Those are ones that are really problematic. It, it's kind of hard to track pub, private business to help on any of those. Any thoughts, Greg? How are we going to handle that? Well, I mean, we're committed to both those projects, obviously, right. and all the urban court uh, freeway system and 
Um, we are, again, we're, we're looking to the private sector to, to partner with them. Now, we're not going to go to them and ask for a handout. Uh, I mean, the private companies get into infrastructure because they want to make a profit. Exactly. Um, so on the case of the Cleveland Interbelt, uh, there's a company that came to us and said, we'll finance it for you, and we're actually looking we're looking at that right now, and we're going to go out with a release to – it's already been designed. I mean, Myron, it'll be done next year, right? Sure. And so it's a build finance. The company will build it and finance it, and we'll pay them back over time. That'll bring it from 2016 back to next year. And so those are the kind of things. Brent Spence, I was in Kentucky on Tuesday talking with the Kentucky Trans Transportation Cabinet. Um, they don't want to even hear the word toll, but we're going to talk about tolls. We're going to study – that bridge, it's a $2.5 billion project. We sat there together. We get about $1.7 billion in federal dollars every year. Kentucky gets about $450 million. If you put both of their programs together, it won't pay for the bridge. And so that's the reality of that bridge, is that we have to look at different ways to deliver it. Again, the private sector will be engaged on that one to make sure that, hey, you know, we're going to build this. We'll pay it back over time. What we do with the tolls, if it is tolled, uh, which it will be, um, you know, it will come off after it's paid for or not. That's for, for future decisions. But we have to look at different ways to deliver or we just simply won't deliver. In downtown Cincinnati, the business coalitions, the chambers, they've come together. They have a coalition. They're going out and trying to educate the public on the need for the, the infrastructure. They're going down to Frankfort, Kentucky to, legis to lobby their legislator on tolls. Uh, it's it's very great working with the folks down there and up here for that matter. Um, okay, Virginia, um, the Brent Spence Bridge alone uh, would absorb both Kentucky and Ohio's entire highway allotment for two years. That's how big that project is. On the other hand, Ohio and Kentucky—that's Speaker Boehner and Minority Leader, perhaps Majority Leader McConnell. There is some interest in Congress, uh, mostly from folks who have big projects like this, to insert in the next major transportation reauthorization bill, not the one they're working on now, but the one they'll have to start next year, for projects of regional and national significance. Most of these projects are in the interstate system. It's clearly a federal responsibility. They're huge. States can't handle them within their regular allotment. If they even tried, everything else in the state would just dry on the vine. So what our challenge is, is to get folks from states like Wyoming and Idaho to support something like that, because they will never get very much out of a fund that does major projects. What's been done in the past is to guarantee them a certain percentage of such a fund so that they always get a little something out of it, and they have something at stake in supporting something like that. There is some talk, um, quiet at the moment, about restoring earmarks. I have mixed feelings about that. I think we're much more likely to get a program of national and regional significance projects where there is some more um, organized way to evaluate their contribution to the national system. Well, we have just the last couple of minutes, and what I wanted to do is give each of any of you the opportunity to say something nice about Howard. Since this is, <laughs> everybody else been, uh, have the opportunity, wanted to give you, and many of you know, have worked with Howard many years, and this is your last chance to, 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 I guess, to publicly um, either uh, praise him or, or, or bash him, or however you want to do it, so um, open it up. Virginia, I want to start first, since you probably know him the longest. Howard has been a friend, an advisor, a wonderful listener. Even when projects are thorny, he, he always seems to think that things can be worked out. And he's relentless in her, his pursuit of something that will make everybody happy. Um, one of the things that I learned early on, um, Del Latta was the one that told me, uh, and he basically said, your job is not to get support from all of the Ohio delegation for what you want. It's to make sure that no one comes out against you. And Howard is incredible at making sure that not only we have the support to do the things we need to do most, but that the people who don't directly benefit from that project still feel they have a stake in what's going on at Nowagon and what's going on in the region. Joe, hey. Um, Howard is Mr. Consensus and mm -hmm. uh, you know, just done a great job in, in everything he, he did. Uh, certainly in a lot from him. has been very important to, to me and certainly RTA. Howard, I just want to thank you for all your efforts. and. Uh, once you retire, we'll work on that golf game a little bit. <laughs> Anybody else? I think Sorry. we first met when uh, we were working downtown on, with Cooper Carey on the Lower Euclid plan. And Joe, I know you were working on that too. And what 
strikes me about that is we all came with different perspectives of you know what downtown and what Euclid Avenue and what um, the the corridor should feel like and you know Joe had one and I was a violinist so I didn't even know what I was talking about but um, but we all started and and what was really the learning for me was how people could sit around a table and this is really striking and try new things and look at new experiences and say wait a minute maybe the way we've done in the past you know it doesn't work and maybe we need to do it and, and so to learn from people who are willing to be that flexible and willing to try new things was for me just such a a, a moment of, uh, of of learning that you know I really appreciate I really appreciate that I'd, I'd like to say that my first um, meeting with um, Howard uh, also is when I met Bob Cliver which was uh, around the Detroit Superior Bridge project when I was the director of Cleveland Public Art you know small arts organization who tried to do the Detroit Superior Bridge Project, a little crazy uh, idea. But um, both Howard and Bob, um, I think their willingness and openness um, to try something new, and in that case, um, really try to make a street more complete for pedestrians, bikers, and cyclists, um, uh, taught me that there's some really good people out there who are willing to take some risk and to do something new. As difficult as that project was, kind of cut my teeth into um, how um, I think that uh, we can all work together to make this city better. So thank you for supporting me through that. You too, Bob. It's a great project. Yeah. Greg? Um, great hair. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, I th Howard, you're an institution with the MPOs. You've been around forever. You, I mean, you've seen a lot of executive directors come and go. Uh, you're going to be missed. And I'd have to say you're a great man if you had to put up with uh, Dale Schiavone for 37 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I guess I'll, I'll just have the last word. Uh, you know, there, there's, a, there's a job, there's a saying that if you do a, if you do a job too well, you'll get stuck with it. Um, I think um, he, he was doing a, a very good job, and he did it very well, and we're, we're very fortunate, but we didn't get stuck with him. And thank you very much, Howard. With that, I want to thank our panelists.